I want to say hello and welcome everybody to the Zuda Family Leaders in Parkinson's Disease Speaker Series. My name is Chris Watts. I am Dean of the Harris College of Nursing and Health Sciences here at TCU. I'm also a professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders, and it's my privilege to host this event for you. I'm looking forward to hearing about updates and recent advances into the fight against Parkinson's disease with one of the, le the, the world's leading experts, Dr. Michael Oaken. We're very fortunate to have him here today. So the agenda today is gonna start uh, with some, some words from me and then words from the Zuda family, followed by Dr. Oaken's lecture. And then there'll be time after the lecture for questions uh, from the audience to Dr. Oaken. And after the q and I'll say some concluding remarks, and then we hope to, to wrap up by 11.30. There's a number of people in the room today uh, who I'm connected with and have been connected with for many years. Um, I arrived at TCU in 2008 and brought my program of research into Parkinson's disease here with me. And many in the room have participated in that research. And while getting to know you, I realized very early on in my time here that uh, there were really a lack of resources for people in, with Parkinson's disease in the Fort Worth area, uh, including Tarrant County. And there was really no central resource that people could go to to learn about the opportunities and uh, resources that were out there for them in this, in this area. And so because of that, I decided to create this project that we call Endeavor Parkinsonology. And the vision of Endeavor Parkinsonology is really uh, building a community of individuals to improve the life of those living and fighting against Parkinson's disease. And I think given the number of people in the room today, we're, we're well on our way to doing that. So this is it's very exciting, very good. Um, so to accomplish that vision that we have with Endeavor Parkinsonology, we have three primary goals. To provide information on, and also access to exercise programs which can increase the ability to live life well. Also to connect individuals together, especially with those in the medical and healthcare communities, uh, who have spe a special focus in Parkinson's disease, and then also to advance our knowledge of Parkinson's disease through education and research. So over the years, because of gifts uh, from people like those in the room today, we've been able to not only provide information about exercise programs for people with Parkinson's disease, uh, but also we've helped support their ability to participate in those programs. And those who have connected with Endeavor Parkinsonology over the years have been able to participate in programs such as Power Moves for PD, Yoga for Parkinson's, uh, group voice exercise classes, and also exercise classes designed by physical therapists uh, right here in the Fort Worth community. Many of you have also been connected to world champion boxer Polly Ayala's gym, the University of Hard Knocks. Uh, what a great name for a gym. Uh, started by a world champion boxer. And uh, at that gym, he has a non-contact boxing exercise program called Punching Out Parkinson's. And Endeavor Parkinsonology has a long collaboration with that program and our research into the effects of non-contact boxing exercise on the physical symptoms of Parkinson's disease was recently highlighted in TCU Magazine. Got that great picture with Polly there. Uh, very proud of that. Also the Fort Worth Business Press and WFAA. So the research arm of Endeavor Parkinsonology has helped to create new knowledge about the effects of Parkinson's on communication and swallowing. And to date, through the research in my lab, uh, we've published dozens of papers in some of the leading scientific journals of, of my discipline, which is Communication Sciences and Disorders. And we continue to pursue research that will help inform the development of new treatments, which will hopefully improve communication and swallowing uh, that result from Parkinson's disease. It was through that research that uh, I met members of the Zuda family. And Murray Zuda, who's here with us today, was one of the first people to volunteer in my lab as a participant. And over the years, I think he's participated as a volunteer in just about every study that I've conducted in that lab. And every time Murray traveled to the lab, uh, he was accompanied by his beautiful wife and companion, Eleanor. And together, uh, we shared family connections to TCU, 
uh, a love of baseball, especially TCU baseball. Eleanor was just a massive TCU baseball fan. Um, a love of travel, and I think a common humor that allowed us to have a lot of laughs together. And over time, I developed a, a great friendship with Murray and Eleanor, and they always encouraged me and supported me. And were always a clear reminder about the importance of the work that I was doing. And while Eleanor can't be with us here today, her memory remains vivid in my heart. And I'm lucky to say also that my connection with Murray remains strong and loyal. And I'm lucky to call him a friend. Of course, this lecture series bears the Zuda family name, and today's event would not be possible without their support. The Zuda family represents why TCU is one of our nation's top universities. A private university like TCU is only as strong as its alumni and those champions who support our university. And as a family of horned frogs who continually support TCU, year after year, the Zuda family enables our university to transform the lives of students and our community. The Zuda Family Leaders in Parkinson's Disease Speaker Series is a great example of how they are doing exactly that. So on behalf of Harris College and TCU, thank you for your support. It's now my honor to call on Andrew Zuda to say some words on the family's behalf. All right, good morning, everybody. All right, I just put down a few words. Um, it is with immense gratitude and excitement that we are here today to mark the inaugural Leaders in Parkinson's Disease Speaker Series. On behalf of my family, most of which are sitting here, um, we'd first like to thank TCU and Dr. Watts and his team, and of course, all of you in attendance. Um, Dr. Watts, your vision to bring national and international thought leaders to C TCU to share the latest in Parkinson's research, clinical advances, and trends to the global community is inspiring, and our family is excited to be a part of it for years to come. Our hope is that the speaker series serves as a source of inspiration, a beacon of optimism that not only acknowledges the challenges posed by Parkinson's, but also highlights the strides being made in research, treatment, and care. So I moved to T uh, Fort Worth in 1996 to uh, enroll in TCU's PhD uh, program in psychology, where I met my wife. We both graduated uh, in 2000 with our doctorates. And um, I remember after my first exam in, in graduate school, my major professor said to me, jokingly, I think, uh, you can never tell with him, after finding out I got an A on my uh, first exam, well, why'd you do that? You have nowhere to go but down. <laughs> well, Dr. Watts, I think I can say the same to you. After uh, finding out that Dr. Oaken was our inaugural speaker. Uh, Dr. Oaken, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on campus to speak to this group. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, to that end, I'd like to thank my dad, Murray, whose uh, commitment to his family and to fighting Parkinson's as a patient and as an advocate for others who are living with Parkinson's as well. We hope the speaker series leaves each of you with hope and the comfort in knowing that you are not in this fight alone. So on behalf of my family, we extend our heartfelt appreciation for your presence, your support, and your shared commitment to making a positive impact. Thank you all very much. Okay, now to the main event, the reason we're all here. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the inaugural keynote speaker for the Zuda Family Leaders in Parkinson's Disease Speaker Series, Dr. Michael Oaken. Dr. Oaken completed his medical degree at the University of Florida, followed by internship and residency also at the University of Florida. So if you couldn't tell, he's obviously a Gator fan. <laughs> we're not gonna hold that against him today. Uh, following his residency, Dr. Oaken completed a fellowship in movement disorders and surgery for movement disorders at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Dr. Oaken is a board certified neurologist, a movement disorder specialist, a neuroscientist, and also an author. He co-founded and co-directs the internationally renowned movement disorders program at the University of Florida called the Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Disorders. Since 2006, he's also served as both medical director and most recently as the medical advisor for the Parkinson's Foundation. Dr. Oaken has described his clinical approach as viewing the patient as the sun, where the patient is at the center of all care decisions. His clinical work extends beyond Parkinson's disease and encompasses a variety of movement disorders, including uh, Tourette syndrome and dystonia. Dr. Oaken's, Oaken's program of research adopted a neuroethics-based approach where the real-world clinical setting is used for research into neurological conditions. And he's been a prolific scientist and is an internationally recognized thought leader in movement disorders and especially Parkinson's disease. He's regularly asked to speak at major national and international conferences. He's published hundreds of research papers in the world's leading scientific journals, uh, including the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, or Lancet, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. He's also authored or co-authored 14 books, including the recent release, Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription for Action. If you haven't read that book, uh, I encourage you to, to go do that. And that book was co-authored by Dr. Ray Dorsey and Dr. Bastian Blum. Dr. Oaken has been a lead or co-investigator on multiple clinical trials which seek to advance our understanding of Parkinson's disease, including work into the application of deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's and other movement disorders. Now, the ultimate mark of peer respect for a scientific program of research is the award of external funding from agencies which conduct peer reviews of proposals. And Dr. Oaken's research has been externally funded numerous times by agencies such as the National Institute of Health, the Smallwood Foundation, the Tourette Association of America, Parkinson's Alliance, the Parkinson's Foundation, and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So I think the evidence is clear that what we have with us here today is one of the world's leading authorities in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease. So it's my honor to welcome Dr. Michael Oaken to speak with us. I hope that you please help me welcome him to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a it's an absolute honor. It's a pleasure, and um, and it, it's it's a delight to see all of you here today. And I know many of you have driven long distances and traveled long to be here. And so um, so we'll we'll try to make it worth the the Horn Frogs you know journey you know, and uh, and I know the Horn Frog is also an endangered species. So maybe we, you know, together can make Parkinson an endangered species and talk about ways that we can do that. And so, um, so I just want to um, just share with you today, you know, <clears throat> some of my journey and some of the thoughts that we have about how we can um, impact more lives and try to create a, a pathway for folks and thinking about where we can go with Parkinson. I do have to tell you just for parody that um, I studied history when I was an undergraduate. I have a degree in history, and that degree is from Florida State, okay? And, um, and so, so between Tallahassee, Gainesville, and then I studied at a university called Emory University where I met my wife, that they say that's kind of the Bermuda Triangle, you know, of science there. So, 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 uh, so I can I can go a lot of different ways. So today I'm going to be a complete horn frog. And if you saw me this morning doing my exercise, which everybody with Parkinson, right, Murray, should do exercise every day, I had a TCU hat on that was left for me by Chris in the hotel, and uh, and was doing a really good impersonation. People were treating me really well when I put that hat on. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, hey, you know, I think this this is probably a good thing. So, um, so the first thing that I want to start with here is um, is this picture, okay? And this is the horn frog, right? This is an endangered species. You know this species? You've seen this before? Okay, so. If you look, this is actually a, a picture in the upper left. 
That is actually a, a Horn Frog alumni, and that's an alumni ring, okay, on the Horn Frog, okay. This is uh, a movement disorder that that actually uh, developed on this campus, and <laughs> <laughs> we uh, actually call this a tribal hand, okay? A tribal hand, meaning that you make this abnormal movement. But it turns out that if you look at the other pictures here, so on the lower left, that Murray is a picture of somebody with Parkinson disease, okay? Who can get a movement disorder called dystonia, and dystonia is when the muscles fight against each other. So when mus one muscle contracts, another has to relax. When that doesn't happen in sequence because of your brain signals, when that doesn't happen in the right sequence, you end up co-contracting and you end up in these postures. It's actually very common in Parkinson for the toes to curl, the hands to curl, and the hands to, to change uh, position. And so what I want to point out to you is that the hand of the, of, the, uh, of the horn frog, okay? The horn frog hand is a tribal hand, okay? That is not a, uh, what, what we think of as a medical disease. <laughs> now, it is possible if you continue to do this posture over and over and over and over again, it can actually imprint and you might develop dystonia which is actually one of the things called task-specific dystonia. So if you see somebody that does not have Parkinson disease and is doing this all the time, inappropriately, okay, <laughs> it might be that they have developed dystonia, okay, but that's different than Parkinson. And then there's another disorder called Wilson's disease, and so there's a whole bunch of different disorders that can cause these types of hands. But I, we thought it was fun. Chris and I were talking about it last night at the Rangers game, and uh, it would be fun to share with you. Okay, so here we are at the Rangers game, okay? <laughs> now, here is your challenge, okay, as a group, okay? You can see here, I'm not doing this tribal sign, okay? <laughs> but but Because I don't know how yet. I haven't learned, and, and I think it's a secret, like, handshake kind of thing. Like, if you do it and you shouldn't be doing it, they shoot you or do something bad to you. So I'm not doing it, so you see me on the far left. In this picture, you have people who are TCU alumnuses, you have people who have Parkinson's disease, and you have people without Parkinson's disease. And you can see how difficult it is to tell the difference between what, a, what is really a tribal hand and, and what is not. But, but at any rate, I, I leave you with that. This is our group. Um, the, the, uh, the tribalism of our group is this thing, like this. I, I don't like it, so I don't do it that, that much, but there's a gator there. But, um, but, but uh, we are in Florida, just a little north of Disney World, so if you're ever uh, in the area, please stop by and come, come see us. We're called the Norman Fixell Institute. We're happy to see you. And this is just the grant support. Anytime I speak, I always credit the government. I know everybody is always nuts about what's going on in the news and everything, but guess what? The number one bipartisan thing that we can all agree on is our health, okay? National Institutes of Health still the largest funder of research in the United States, and so I'm very grateful to them for the grants that they've funded me on uh, over many years. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a journey we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, a pandemic, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what we can do to kind of get out in front of these things, and then what are some of the hottest research advances and things that we're looking at. I learned a long time ago in traveling the world, you never walk into a room with folks with Parkinson not ready to talk about what the newest thing is, right? That's why you, you, you want to come out and see what's going on, and there's so many cool things going on. So I'm excited to tell you about those things. Now, a number of years ago, we wrote a book called Ending Parkinson's Disease, Ray Dorsey, Boston Bloom, Todd Scherer, and I. And the original title of that book was called A Parkinson Pandemic, or The Parkinson Pandemic, A Prescription for Action. Any of you who have ever written know that anytime you write something, the publisher changes the title, okay? So the publisher changed the title after, you know, back and forth, you know, 200 different, you know, you know potential things. We didn't like this, we like this. Wasn't actually sure that I liked this title. When the book dropped from Hashtag Publishing, it dropped in the same month that COVID-19 hit the United States in a, in a major way, in March. And, and the publisher went, 
oh my God, we should, we should have left the original title of the book. I mean, they, they were like, you know, and it was too late. It had already printed and gone out to press. The reason that I bring this up is that the word pandemic, you know, pan means all, okay, in Greek, and, and it has Greek and Latin derivations, and demos means people, right? And when you think about the word pandemic, it wasn't actually invented as a word or coined as a word to be associated only with infectious diseases. It's just that over time, it became that. And I think it's very appropriate because when you say pandemic, people, you, know, you sit up, right, in your chair, especially now. And about every 100 years, we have a pandemic that lasts three or four years, okay? And when we think about the definition of a pandemic, we think about something that affects all people, all regions, all continents, everyone across the globe, okay? Men, women, everyone. And when you think about that, you also think about the growth, the explosive growth of something. And if you look at the fundamental features of a pandemic, and then you look at a disease like Parkinson's disease, guess what, folks? They fit, okay? And the growth in Parkinson's disease is absolutely phenomenal, and it's something that we really need to, to pay attention to. And so if you think about how big the challenge is, okay, I sit on a committee for the World Health Organization, and we recently published a, a paper in JAMA about this, and, and the World Health Organization and several guidelines have now published and everybody now agrees that the number one fastest growing disease in neurological disorders, Murray, Parkinson's. It is now growing faster than Alzheimer's. So there may be more cases of Alzheimer's, but it's actually growing faster than Alzheimer's disease. So if you think about that, you've got to think, you know, gosh, there's, there's something here that, um, that, that we really need to be paying attention to. If you were in a classroom growing up in the old days, I don't know how many you know, students they put in a classroom. They, they used to put about 30 kids, 25, 30 kids in a classroom. That was kind of the cohort of, of kids as you went through grade school and you had a teacher, right? So if you think about one in 15 people are going to get Parkinson in a lifetime, and that number is actually getting larger in terms of the percentage, but right now it's sitting at one in 15. That means two people that you know that you grew up with in grade school in that classroom are gonna get Parkinson disease, okay? And if more people live longer, and some people's greatest dream is to live longer, okay? Not live better, okay? But if people reach that dream to live as long as they wanted to, we would have a lot of cases of Parkinson disease, okay? So this should set off alarm bells, okay? And the alarm bells here, it's not important that you see the numbers. Just look at the stacks here, okay? Notice they are purple stacks today, okay? <laughs> I don't know why they're purple today, but they just happen to be purple stacks. I thought maybe that might catch your attention, okay? If you see the stacks here, in 1990, three million cases, okay? And if you start looking in 25-year epochs, we may need to turn this down Getting a little. If you start looking at the epochs, okay, if you look at 25-year epochs, okay, for Parkinson, I think that the gain is a little too high on the thing. That's no, no problem. So if you look at 25-year at, at epochs from 1990 to 2015, okay, it's going to double, okay? 2015 to 2040, going to double again, okay? It's a problem. It's a problem. This can bankrupt healthcare systems, okay? It can create huge amounts of suffering and disability for people. And we're frankly not ready for this. Medicare is not ready to handle this in the United States. Health systems all over the world are not ready to handle it. Low income countries have zero way to, to handle this particular growth. And the doubling that we see, the doubling that we see with Parkinson, okay? cannot be accounted for just by lots more people living on the earth and life expectancy doubling, okay? When Stephen Ambrose was a visiting professor at the University of Florida many years ago, I had taken care of his friend who was a distinguished professor of history. He came to give this 
memorial talk for him, was nice enough to waive his fee. Time Magazine was there. It was right around the time of the millennium. And they asked him, what is the, the greatest accomplishment of the next 100 years going to be? Okay, this was at the millennium. And he said, first he said, I don't know. I'm just a historian. Like, what do you, you know, like I go backwards. I don't go forward, right? I, so I don't have an answer to this question. He thought about it. And he said, doubling how long people will live. Okay. And then we got into a discussion at the table. Do you really want to live to be 200 years old you know, or not? And so that's a different philosophical discussion. Okay. But if you think about the doubling of the life expectancy, these are numbers. You can find this anywhere on the internet, okay, all the way back to 1850. Okay, and you start to look. It is absolutely stunning how much longer we live. And when we live longer, we get more degenerative diseases. Okay, so that is a problem. And that's one of the problems that's driving Parkinson's disease. But that is not the only thing that's driving the growth of the disease. And so we need to understand why we have this growth. And so we created a White House campaign, okay? And we called it a give a dime campaign. And we were going to have people mail dimes to the White House just like they did for March of Dimes, okay? But then we found out after March of Dimes, they made it illegal to, to, uh, to uh, mail money to the White House. <laughs> so we said, ah, we don't look really good in orange jumpsuits, or maybe they're purple jumpsuits here in Texas. But um, so, so we wanted to understand the different diseases, and we wanted to think to ourselves, how did each of these diseases get to an end? How did they get to a cure? So we wrote about polio. We wrote about HIV, we wrote about breast cancer and their journey and where they're on, and we, and we said, well, where would we be if we put Parkinson on the journey? And so we, after extensive you know, months and months and maybe even a few years of research, decided that the formula was what's called a pact. So the way that other people have done it is we have to prevent, we have to advocate, we have to care, and we have to treat. Okay? And so we actually flooded the White House with these red card campaigns, you know, in coincident with the book. And then there was a group, a grassroots group called the PD Avengers. These are persons who have Parkinson's disease, and now there are thousands of them and growing that are creating the voice. And we have to have a bigger voice if we're going to, to move things in the right direction and, and get ahead of what is the, the, the issues and the disease. So let's first talk about prevention, okay? Now here you see an orange barrel and a blue barrel, okay? When we think about pesticides and things that get into the environment, okay, things can be spilled on purpose and things can be spilled by accident, okay? And during the Industrial Revolution, we had all these machines that came along and Smog came because of the machines, and, and, and we started to do all of these wonderful things. But the downstream consequences of that with our water supplies and with our, our health is, is that we weren't paying attention to what got into the environment. Okay? And so here you can see a picture of a, an orange barrel, okay? and that is Agent Orange. Does anybody know why they call it Agent Orange? Be because... That's correct. So the barrel is orange, okay, with the band. So, so it actually isn't that it turns you orange or, or something like that. It's that, they, that it is orange. And so they sprayed that to defoliate in Vietnam, and it actually is out there. And then there's, there's another barrel here. The blue barrel is TCE, trichloroethylate, which is something that gets into our water supply. And if you look here, you have to ask yourself where you live. And so marked on the map here, you can see sites. These are Superfund sites. This is what the, the U.S. government has decided they need to clean up, okay, and, and go around. And they're, they're woefully behind on cleaning these sites up. But if you actually look at Superfund sites here, okay, you'll be very surprised, like, where they are. My Superfund site in Gainesville is right underneath my favorite pizza joint. Okay, so you know, I'm not going to stop going to the pizza joint, but I am now aware that this is not a good mix. Okay, maybe you won't drink the water there uh, out of the tap. So, and you think about this, it, it is something that 
needs to draw our attention for P, for the prevention, okay? So this is a study that recently came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, their neurology version of the journal. This was over 300,000 veterans. Any veterans here in the room? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your service. So, so it turns out that if you look, and this is the whole Camp Lejeune thing, if you're tired of seeing that on TV, you can blame us you know, for, for continuing to publish on these things in the environment. It's all in the Ending Parkinson's Disease book. And then it, people realized, oh my gosh, and they did a study and they saw the risk is higher, 70% higher, if you were at Camp Lejeune compared to other places, a very common place to do basic training. So preventing Parkinson is the P, okay? Do you know the chemicals and pesticides to avoid? Do you pay attention to where you live? Do you use air filters? Do you replace the air filters and use high quality air filters in your home? That can actually make a difference, okay? Are we using apps, okay, and support? Um, you know, are we supporting bands together? Are we, are we putting our voices together on knowledge that we have that we know? So Paraquat has been banned in 32 countries including China, but is still available in the US and it still continues to double through multiple administrations, okay? With a very high odds ratio. If you went to Las Vegas with Chris and you went up and you decided, you and Chris were gonna make some bets. If you bet on the odds of Paraquat and Parkinson disease, you could win some money, okay? It's a pretty high odds ratio. We know that, so there is a potential to prevent. So that's P, P-A-C-T. How about A? A is for advocate, okay? And here is a picture of FDR with a radio personality, Eddie Cantor. Anybody know who Eddie Cantor was? The radio personality, very famous radio, radio personality. And they had an amazing, maybe one of the best advocacy machines for uh, a disease ever, okay? We need to emulate that in Parkinson. We're not doing enough. Okay, I've been in the field now, I'm into my third decade, and I would give my grade failing. Even though I've been trying my whole career, we're still failing. We haven't created enough of a movement. And so some of the movements that we've seen that have been great that we can learn from, HIV, okay? Here they put a condom over Senator um, Representative Helms' uh, house. Uh, you know, and, uh, and they, they created an awareness, they caught the news cycle, and, and Holmes never voted against HIV again, like uh, after, after this, okay? Here is a peaceful protest, a peaceful sit-in at the FDA, and of course you've seen all of the things they've done on the National Mall with creating, you know, really great awareness banners and then joining them together into quilts and things like that. We need to do more of that in Parkinson disease. You know, we are not doing enough. We haven't hit the inflection point that other diseases have hit. So that's the A. P, A, prevent, advocate. How about the C, care? Well, it turns out that there are now 90,000 new cases a year of Parkinson disease, okay? And this is a picture that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association and by Melissa Armstrong showing that Parkinson isn't just a male disease. Sorry, Murray, okay? Men and women can get it, okay? You don't dominate this show, okay? And it has all sorts of different manifestations, okay? Not just these pseudo-tribal horn fog signs. So you meet one Parkinson person, you meet one Parkinson person. And so, so we have to understand the breath, that it's not this old um, sketch diagram, you know, from the 1880s. It's a different disease and it can be very treatable, okay? But the cases now, have increased. Allison Willis and colleagues published a paper in Nature Parkinson Journal showing that cases have increased by more than 50%. We were undercounting even the cases. This is concerning, okay? So the incidence is increasing and every six minutes, someone is diagnosed with Parkinson. Now, it used to be every nine, okay? We made a mistake, it happens. Scientists make mistakes, okay? It's every six minutes, okay? And so when we think about care, I think about some tips to leave you with. This was from a book that we wrote a number of years ago called Parkinson, 10 Secrets to a Happier Life. It says, I look for a sign, where to go next. You never know when you'll get one. Even the most faithless among us are waiting to be proven wrong, okay? 
And so understanding what you have and what you don't have. Parkinson's is not Alzheimer's disease. And so my apologies to people that are in the Alzheimer's field. But the, the trajectory, the treatments, what we have available for Parkinson's completely different and a completely better okay, pathway, a better road. And understanding that is important because most people, when you say you have Parkinson, what do they say? Parkinson, Alzheimer's, they're all the same. Okay? Maybe you all are smarter because you wear purple. Okay? But, 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 but most people are not. Another tip to thinking about is to think about what we're doing, how we're doing it. And so this is a quote by Joshua Harris. This is something that has been done over and over and over, you know, over many centuries, this quote. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Okay, you know this quote. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. You've heard this, okay, many times. For Parkinson, one of the tricks is you have to pay attention to timing. The disease changes over time. And it isn't as important which pill you're on, how many different um, colored pills, the, the purple one, the, the, the red one, the black one, the white one. It's more about the timing of how you're administering not only medicines, but other behavioral therapies like exercise. Timing is absolutely critical. One of the tips that we don't, we don't emphasize. If you have Parkinson, you need to tell your either advanced practice provider or your doctor, whoever the clinician is that's seeing you, to pull you. It sounds a little mean. You need to be pulled at every visit, okay? If you're not being pulled at every visit, okay, that's, there's a problem, okay? And the reason for that is, is that we want to prevent falls, we want to understand postural instability, and we want to be out in front. So before something happens, we can intervene, okay? And when you pull, okay, and you can see a very famous neurologist, Dr. Fawn, Stanley Fawn from Columbia. Here I have a picture of him pulling. In America, they pull on the shoulders. In Europe, they pull on the hips, okay? <laughs> so, so it's different, but, but be pulled because this is super important. The prevention of fractures and falls, huge, hugely important. We don't pay attention to it. Here's another one. We write a blog, a free blog called parkinsonsecrets.com. And in that blog, you know, every month we give a tip or something new that's going on in the field. We put this one out. It kind of went viral and people were like, what do you mean? You take one multivitamin a day. Like, why is that any different in Parkinson? Well, here's the straight scoop. A lot of people come in to see me and other practitioners and they bring a bag of nutritional supplements with them, a bag. We take them out one by one and we go through and we make sure, you know, what's safe, what's not safe, what can be overdosed, what can't be overdosed, okay? But people don't realize that if you have Parkinson and you're on dopamine replacement, the most important thing you need is one multivitamin along with that. One multivitamin. So if you're not doing that, you should. And the reason is, is that when we give dopamine, it does deplete a few of the other vitamins, like B12, like folate, like B6, and it can increase another vitamin level. And so you need to be monitored with both exams and also make sure that you're taking one simple vitamin. So if, if you took that bag and threw it away, not that I'm saying that you should, of all these extra supplements that you get on TV or in the store and everything, and you bought a boat, probably not a boat because you'll, you'll spend more money on the boat than anything, but maybe you take that bag, you throw it away, and you <clears throat> buy a new car. Some of these cost a lot of money. And you take one multivitamin a day, you'll protect yourself you know, much better than everything else. And so just keep in mind the basics you know, like before you get to thinking about advanced types of therapies. People often don't think about that. Another one that we recently talked about in the blog was you know, <clears throat> the fact that the chances of you with Parkinson disease getting melanoma are how much greater? How much greater? Toss out a number. Double. Double, okay. Somebody reads the blog. You got it, okay. Double, okay. We know this, okay. This is the drip, drip, drip of many papers, okay. And then at some point you just have to say, okay, I give up. This is true, okay. This is true. You're going to be at higher risk to get a skin cancer with Parkinson. Yet we don't counsel people. We don't tell them the things that they can do to reduce your risk. And if you get on a tanning bed, even when you don't have Parkinson, risk of a melanoma goes up by 75%, according to the Cure Melanoma Foundation, okay? So now imagine if you have Parkinson disease 
and you like to have a nice tan, okay, you know, on the tanning bed, we need to be educating people. Something preventable, something we know, something we haven't been passing on to, to folks, so super important. If you have Parkinson, there's a good chance that you'll go to the hospital, okay? And, and once you go to the hospital once, there's a good chance that you'll go again. The hospitalization rates are really high. So Jerry Kintz has this quote. It says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and the nurses are all very nice, okay? It's a little bit dark, but we run this Parkinson Foundation hotline called 1-800-4-PARKINSON-INFO. So for the younger kids here, you may not know this, but there are these things called telephones, okay? They used to be on the wall and they used to have a curly cord on it and you take the phone off and if you look at the numbers on the phone, the numbers have letters. Like next, did you know that? You didn't know that? No. Okay. All right, the numbers have letters, okay? And so 1-800-4PD-INFO, and that's how we would tell people to call these different hotlines, okay? So if you, if you call that, people call this, we realize that people were get, either getting hurt or checking into the hospital and not checking out. And so after dozens of papers that we wrote on this, we needed to do something. And so these are free kits you can download, okay? And when you go in the hospital, it's like if you have a, a child, the first time you have a child, you pack the bag because you have to keep going to the hospital. You gotta be ready. So when you're a Parkinson person, you gotta be ready to go to the hospital. And it has rip-offs for, to give to your doctors, to give to your nurses, because they have no idea how to take care of you, okay? So you're gonna be the ones that teach them, and this can save lives and save, save all sorts of issues. How about exercise? Everybody says you should exercise, right? What do they tell you? They say, I should you should exercise, right? Okay, and the, the best exercise is the exercise that you are willing to what? To do, that's right, okay, so, 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 so it's one thing to tell people to exercise all the time, it's like a, a nagging, parent or grandparent, no offense to anybody in the room, I'm also a parent, I'm also a nagger. So the idea is, is that we're doing it wrong. We should be telling people how to construct a plan, okay? It's not enough to just say exercise all the time, Chris Watts. You need a plan, okay, and you need whatever that plan is, somebody needs to be a captain, and somebody needs to be checking in on that plan because we know if it's done frequently, remember timing, it can be life-changing with Parkinson. It can be like a drug. And some people with Parkinson disease will say, um, and I heard it this morning from Greg, you know, that, that, you know, I know that you all are really smart and everything, but it might be that, you know, physical, occupational, speech, and swallow are actually more powerful for me than, than these pills. And so it's important. Another tip is thinking about nutrition, okay? And I like to say, you know, be careful of what I call nutritional overreach. And, and what, I, what I term nutritional overreach is lots of people writing books and creating internet blogs and TED Talks and everything without any research scientific data. You buy their books, you do their program, then you do somebody else's program, you do another program, and you're on South Beach this. And this has been going on for years. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, okay? We know if you don't take care of your body, where are you gonna live? So we know nutrition is important. However, there is still a lot for us to learn. The microbiome is a great area of research in Parkinson's disease and we're learning a lot. But we don't know so much that we should be transplanting into all Parkinson patients, you know, fecal transplants. Not that that sounds like something I'd like to receive, but, but, but it is something that we need to learn more about because there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different bacteria and phages and things, and we can measure that, and they can change every minute, every hour. And if we don't understand how we're changing the balance with all of these things, you can make people worse. And so is a probiotic okay for Parkinson? Probably, but you should probably monitor it because in some people it might make you worse, you know, depending on who you are and what your health is, even outside of your Parkinson. Some people it may make better. Some people, it, they may not be able to tell the difference when you're on it. We do have data now that shows that folks that are on Mediterranean diets, lots of olive oil, lots of fish and everything, do tend to do better. Healthy diet, better. Weight, better. Heavier rather than lighter with Parkinson because you, you, will, you will lose weight slowly over time with Parkinson. And so being a little heavier is better than lighter. Adding calories, adding the numbers of times that you eat per day, really good over time and paying attention to your weight 
at every visit, okay? A lot of great research, but let's not overreach, okay? And what's more important than depression? Well, Brad McDaniels and I were talking this morning. He drove in from Denton, Texas, and, um, and we don't think about demoralization. One in six people with Parkinson's disease or more will get demoralized. And they may not be depressed, and they may not be anxious, or they may not be apathetic. You could be just demoralized. Your brain is like a computer. I hate to break it to you. It's a pretty good supercomputer, okay? And if you decide that you're going to give up on something, everything around it will dilapidate. Okay? And you say, well, how is that possible? Okay? Let me put it to you this way. If you had a house okay, and you moved out of that house and you went on vacation around the world for two years, you didn't pay any of the bills on that house and you just left that house alone, what is that house going to look like when it comes back? A disaster. A disaster. Nature is going to overtake the house. If you give up with Parkinson, as Brad and I were talking about, nature is going to overtake you, okay? And so it's important that we recognize, we ask the questions, and we treat, okay? Sleep, super important, okay? Super important for all of us. And I often say, and this is not an advertisement for sleep by number beds, okay? What is your magic sleep number? And when I say magic sleep number, I'm not talking about setting a number on a bed. I'm talking the number of good hours of sleep you get at night. And we are actually becoming more and more attuned, particularly with all these sensors that we have rings and we have watches and everything, about monitoring our sleep. And everybody's a little bit different. And you, sometimes you don't know if you're sleeping well. And so it, it's, you should have a low threshold to do sleep studies in folks who have Parkinson. Make sure that you're sleeping well, okay? And then figure out, starting to become insightful to say, when I get seven hours, when I get eight, eight is the most common number that when people get to, they say, I feel good. If I got eight good hours of sleep, I feel good, I'm ready to go the next day. You need to be ready to go the next day, every day, if you have Parkinson's disease, and even if you don't. So thinking, what is your number? Now, some people, like Chris only needs two hours of sleep. I mean, it's very clear. I've read how many papers he's written and everything, and so that's okay. But don't compare yourself to Chris, okay? You have to figure out what is your number, okay, and what is going to make it good for you. Pain. Pain in Parkinson's disease, super common. Been reported in over three-quarters of cases, very complicated, and sometimes we don't talk the same language when we're talking to our either doctors or advanced practice providers, okay? And so we need to start to approach pain differently. We don't want anybody to be in pain, but we need to understand, like when we're talking, we're not talking different languages. And so the doctor says, do you have pain? The answer is yes, you have this, you know. Pain pills aren't necessarily the right answer. We have to understand where the pain is coming from and Parkinson and address it so you can have a good quality of life. So in other words, we don't want to paint with a broad brush. And so many people, because it's so common, okay, and then people are going to start to come, it'll be the next generation, people are talking about sleep now, trust me, there's going to be a wave where people are going to start talking about pain and everybody's going to get on pain medications and everything. We don't want it to be a one size fits all. And so we want our Parkinson communities to be ready um, as we're thinking about that. So prevent, Advocate, care, pa treat, T, treatment through research, okay? And so that's the last aspect. And so this is the, the part you've been waiting for. You're like, okay, God, finally, he's going to tell us something about what's going on in research. Well, it turns out that if you look at the highest funder of research in the United States, the National Institutes of Health, okay? Highest funder in the world, not just in the U.S., $3 billion a year was spent on HIV, and this prevented thousands, if not millions, of people from ever developing the disease and turned it into a chronic, very treatable disease. In Parkinson, in 2019, about 200 million, probably about 250 million or so goes in per year. That just ain't going to cut it, Greg. We need a much bigger investment. It's got to be 10 or more times higher than that for us to get to you know, that point, especially with it being the, the fastest growing neurological disease. So we have to push for more research. We have to stop fighting each other about whether this is a good idea. We need all ideas and we need, we need more of them. We need to broaden that funnel. And so when we think about treatments, we think about buckets, okay? And so we started this idea in trying to figure out a way to make this very explainable for people back in 2013 when we wrote, you know, 10 Secrets. And we think about, you know, if you're 
concerned about what you're gonna do with your Parkinson and your treatment, there are three buckets that you need to understand. One is the symptomatic bucket. That's the bucket right now, hopefully gonna be powerful. You take something, it helps you now today, okay? So that's the symptomatic, that's the blue bucket in this picture. The, the yellow bucket is the disease modifying bucket. So you have a disease and you wanna slow that disease down, okay? You wanna give some agent and slow it down. If you can slow it down, you know, maybe some other disease is gonna take over and then that becomes the problem and the focus, okay? Slow it down, okay? And there's a new drug called lecanemab for Alzheimer's disease that slightly slows down Alzheimer's. And so there's, there's hope out there, but still searching for these disease-modifying therapies. And then cure, okay, the C bucket, okay? And, and I actually call it the P bucket, not the C bucket, but it's more the precision medicine bucket, thinking about could you have a gene, could you have something where you went in and actually reversed the process that was going on. So these are the buckets that you think about, okay? Dopamine as a treatment is over 50 years old. Doesn't stop disease progression, it's still the top treatment, okay, for Parkinson's disease. Think about that, okay? And when we think about the different things that are coming, I want you to remember what I call the 2-4 rule, okay? This is if you're thinking about these new devices, and there's going to be, I have pictured here, some new pumps that are coming out, and the pumps are gonna push dopamine through the skin. We've been trying for 20 or 30 years to get dopamine to go through the skin. It's a methyl ester. It's really hard to get it to pass through the skin. Finally got it, and just like everything, Murray, like once somebody gets it, somebody else gets it. Now there are two pumps that are rushing the market, almost like together concurrently, which is great for the field, okay? It will give you another one and a half to two hours of what we call good on time, feeling like you're on with reduced tremors, stiffness or slowness. There's also a pump called an apomorphine pump and then an infusion that can go into your, um, your small intestine called a Duopa pump that's already available, okay? The apomorphine pumps are in Europe, okay? And the infusion pumps are available in the US and 44 other countries or 40 something other countries. And then these new skin pumps, which is better in some ways, you know, I think will be more acceptable for people are coming. So that's the two, four rule. So the pumps give you about two more hours of on time. And then there's a, a therapy called deep brain stimulation that gives you three or four hours, okay, of on time. So if you're thinking about it, and you're thinking about these things, thinking about where you are on the continuum is really helpful, okay? And people talk about this 5-2-1 rule, okay? The 5-2, anybody remember when, um, when the guy ran for president and he ran on the 999, you know, 999, okay? So, so if you're thinking about you need to take the next step for a, for a Parkinson therapy, okay? 5-2-1 is helpful, five hours of off time, Okay, or you're taking, I'm sorry, five, you're taking your dopamine five times a day. You have at least two hours of off time and at least one is troublesome potentially with dyskinesia, okay? People talk about that. It is not perfect. It's not a perfect rule, but it does make you start to think about maybe you're gonna pull the trigger on one of these other types of therapies, okay? Then you ask yourself, okay, well, they said the greatest breakthrough if you were watching the news was this new test for Parkinson disease, right? this synuclein seeding test, okay? And, and so there's now a, a skin test for Parkinson disease, and there's a um, scan for Parkinson disease, a DAT scan, okay? And then there's sort of a new assay called a synuclein seeding assay. Let me tell you a little secret, okay? Here's the secret, you ready? If you have Parkinson disease already, you don't necessarily need another test to tell you you have Parkinson's disease, okay? So, so yes, it's a breakthrough in the sense that it can help us to plan for clinical trials, get people in earlier. There's lots of reasons why, but there are lots of instruments, and I think it's important that we develop these instruments, and how these instruments can track progression over time is, is super, super important. And so this new biomarker uh, for Parkinson that you have all read about, it is important to the field. And it came because of, you remember mad cow disease? You all remember that, prion and everything? So when they developed this test for mad cow disease, what they would do is they would take the proteins, good and bad proteins together, and they would quake them. They would shake them for hours, 20 hours, Murray, just 
imagine this going at it, shaking it. And then when they separate, they could use that to see which one had the prion, okay, the mad cow prion in it. People that were clever and they, and they took that test and they've now been able to, to bring that to degenerative diseases like Parkinson disease. And so that's what you start to hear about, what you're reading about in the literature. So keep your eyes on it. But if you already have Parkinson, you're already responding to dopamine and everything, you know, you don't necessarily need another test right now, but you might, it might help in a, in a clinical trial setting. But people are thinking about how can we define Parkinson? And there's this huge debate in the field right now, okay, about how are we going to, to define this disease that is so protean, it's so different. Everybody in this room that has Parkinson is completely different. How are we going to define it? How are we going to stage it? How are we going to talk to each other? Do we have a system so even your doctors and your clinicians can communicate and they know what they're talking about? So if you're in Pensacola or in wherever, like we were talking about this morning, are they talking the same language? Where are you in terms of all these new therapies that are coming? Who's going to get them? How are we going to define them? How are we going to track them? And so the huge important debate in the field, we are about five years behind Alzheimer's disease in these discussions, but we're getting there and we're closing the gap quickly. The glove. So we wrote about this in the, in the parkinsonsecrets.com blog. This is Peter Tass's glove in Stanford. This is about vibration, okay? And vibratory therapy is changing the oscillations in your brain and improving your Parkinson disease, okay? We haven't seen controlled studies with controls yet, okay, from this, but we know going all the way back to this famous guy named Charcot, and Charcot used to bring his patients, they used to come from all over the world, and they would arrive in a carriage. You know what a horse carriage is? Okay, so a horse carriage, they pull up, right? And, and if you're on the horse carriage and you're going over the, the road, what's the road like? Bumpy, okay? And when you're bumpy and the Parkinson patients got out of the carriage, you know, and they, and they showed up, they said, we're better, Professor Sharko, from the bumpy ride or from the train ride in, okay? So we know vibration has, remember the first bucket, a symptomatic effect. But don't get too nuts about this yet. We need more data to see if you're gonna vibrate the hands, how it's gonna last, what it's gonna do, you know, how this can be things. But it is a very interesting thing and can make changes in the brain. Cough syrups for Parkinson sound crazy. Okay, here's some old cough, you know, things. This is a, a drug called Ambroxol, and it works on a pathway on an enzyme called G-case. It's not important that you know that, but one of the most common genetic abnormalities for Parkinson is called GBA1, okay? Also associated with Gaucher's disease. And so there's some hope that this drug, Ambroxol, that's now being tested with the Cure Parkinson Trust in, in Britain, Tony Shapiro developed this, that this might be a pathway for people actually both with this gene and without. And so we'll keep an eye on that and see where it's going. So we're now targeting specific genes. We're putting uh, stimulators and things into the brain to change the way that different areas are talking to each other, neurocircuits. That's kind of what we've done in our lab for a couple of decades. And then we're also looking at drugs and also repurposing of drugs. So there are drugs you hear about like on the news like Humira, and it turns out that some of these drugs, they block this inflammatory um, enzyme and, and uh, substance called tumor necrosis factor. Again, not important, you know that, but just the fact that when they look back at tons of data, people that were on them versus off of them, the people that were on them got less Parkinson and it raises the question, could inflammation, because these things drop inflammation, have something to do with Parkinson. And so now all these people are developing all these inflammatory therapies. So people are working on the microbiome, they're working on inflammation, they're working on repurposing. And so there's a whole bunch of different things that are going on, okay? And a lot of drugs that are on the market now, okay, here's a bunch of them, malaria drugs, antibiotics, the newest one, anti-diabetes drugs, Okay, you see them for obesity, but before they were being used for obesity, people noticed they have some effect potentially in slowing Parkinson disease. So some of them have not turned out well in the trial, but there is one that is still under trial that has some imaging and some really interesting things by Tom Fultini, who is at University College London. And so we're watching that study to see could one of these emerge. Several of you are a bionic, okay, in the room. 
And the bionics of these devices has changed, even over the 20 years when we've been developing them in our lab. And now we're able to draw the signals in on these devices, decode the signals, put out the waves in a different way. We're understanding how the brain interacts with its environment much more than we did before. And we're trying to be more specific. Could these devices grab a hold of these signals and actually respond in, in real time? And so getting smarter with the implants and then how we deliver through those leads in different ways has been shaving off and slowly making, sometimes things get better over time and we don't, we're not paying attention, we don't realize how much better they're getting. Focused ultrasound, okay? So this is like when you push something into the brain, sound waves, and you can blow up a part of the brain, okay, a part of the basal ganglia in the brain, and when you do that, believe it or not, we know this, we've done this in animals for many, many years, for a century or more, and in humans, okay, you can improve symptoms, okay? And so there is a therapy that goes from outside the brain called focused ultrasound. And then one of the new things, okay, and you see this video here, you see what they can do is they can push bubbles, okay? They can inject you with bubbles, okay? And when those bubbles get up to your brain and you push the ultrasound, the sound waves on top of them, it will make the, the bubbles get bigger, push open the blood vessels. And then what happens when you push open the blood vessels? Well, that too, but, but you can slip things in because there are these junctions on the outside so you can slip drugs in. So how we can get drugs specifically into the brain. So when you're hearing about degenerative diseases like Parkinson and Alzheimer's, people are working on ways to deliver them specifically to the brain and using something like an ultrasound in order to deliver things to the brain, which I think is, is really interesting. There's also folks, this is Ed Boyden from MIT, and Ed has been working on pushing electricity from outside the brain so you don't have to put the brain implant in. It's been really difficult to, um, to develop this into humans. There's even an article out just in the past month about how over the last three years it just has been hard to build something to do this. But this is the idea that if you push things from outside the brain, did you ever, did you ever watch the movie Ghostbusters? Did you ever see Ghostbusters? Okay, if you remember Ghostbusters, they say, don't cross the streams, right, right when they're hitting the ghosts. In this therapy, if you cross the streams, Ed Boyden and Nir um, Grossman, they figured out that you could actually stimulate deep in the brain and get deeper than TMS. By actually crossing the streams, you get the difference of the frequency, which is, uh, which is a really interesting and so something that we're watching. We can also push light into the brain. This goes all the way back to Watson and Crick. And when Watson and Crick and Watson wrote this article for Scientific American saying in the 1980s, it will be light therapy for the brains. And that, you know what they say, like these guys won the Nobel and ladies, and then they say, okay, they go a little crazy, right? You know, like after things. And it turns out he's right, okay? We can control channels. We can upregulate uh, up these little things called nanoparticles. And this has led to next generation approaches at DBS. So using um, magnets and electricity, magnets and thermal energy, magnets and ultrasound fields. And so um, a lot of interesting things that are, are going on. So I'm here to tease you today. Okay, Marie said, te didn't you tell me last night, tease them today? Tease them. So I'm here to tease you today and tell you we just finished the 11th annual Deep Brain Stimulation Think Tank. We lock a bunch of people in a room and we force them to work together, kind of like the Manhattan Project, but we don't want to blow anything up, okay? We want them to create new things for folks who have diseases like Parkinson disease. And then finally, I just want to comment on vaccines. The immune system and the brain is something that we're learning a lot about, okay? And we're, we're humbled. Every day I practice medicine, I know a little less, okay? It's a very humbling profession, same in science, okay? William Foge said vaccines are the tugboats of preventative health, and it turns out we can actually stimulate things peripherally to do things in the brain centrally, okay? And we can use the immune system as a way to do that. And you're seeing this with new Alzheimer's drugs. There's been several failed Parkinson drug attempts. And then there's this idea, is inflammation, you know, which has to do with immune responses? Can this have something to do with the disease? And so people are working, you know, to try to figure this out. And it may be just like for cancers, okay? When you go to be treated for a cancer, a lot of the breakthrough came because people packaged and put things together, right? So you see 
the first drug and then the second drug does something different, the third drug, and then suddenly you have these regimens and people are cured of leukemia, okay? And so perhaps it's not, you know, a story about being at the end, okay? It's a story of being at the, the end of the beginning, right? So, so in Parkinson's disease and in Alzheimer's disease, we're starting to actually get drugs that we could be at the end of the beginning, and then if we can build onto those, we're going to see regimens and things that we can do in combination as we move forward. And when we do that, we have to have a way to measure it in the brain, okay? And it's not good enough to just have people tap like this and say, okay, that's a one, that's a two, that's a three. We can't do that anymore, okay? So we have to have a way physiologically to see over time how things are progressing. So this is a large study that David Valancourt and myself and Angela Barampos are running at the University of Florida, a large NIH and Parkinson um, study group study to look at imaging both for diagnosis and then also with the idea long-term to track a disease. If you can track a disease, so if Chris can track the disease when he's developing something in his lab, if he can track the disease, then he needs, instead of recruiting thousands of people, he only needs to recruit hundreds. That drastically changes the game into what we're going to make available for next generation Parkinson therapies. So thank you for the invitation to speak. It's an honor to, to be here. I love your tribal, you know, um, you know, horned frog. And, um, and, and thank you again. It's a pleasure. <laughs>